All right, so I guess the my bio might be a little bit outdated. Uh, I need to write a new one, I guess, <laughs> for the future, because I think it was 2019, uh, like most of it was 2019. Uh, so it's 2024. Uh, now I uh, will we'll, uh, touch on a thing that I do at Laval. So I'm based at Laval University, and I have a GIS project at Laval University. You'll see a little bit of it uh, just because it relates to the technology around uh, consuming GIS right now. Um, but yeah, uh, you, you'll see that um, I do some something outside of Calcul Quebec and uh, the Alliance now that is based in Laval University um, that I think it's exciting. It also related to this. So, uh, so I'm not gonna assume that anyone has any sort of experience uh, regarding GIS or even QGIS. It's uh, GIS is is, is um, a wide field. It's very large. There's a lot of things. It's no wonder that it takes four, three to four years uh, to get a degree in the GIS. So it's a whole discipline. Uh, but more and more people outside of geography, uh, forestry, uh, get get uh, or or uh, geoinformatics end up having to do GIS related stuff. So you need to at least have the basics. So you need to have the vocabulary to start learning and start building new skills around GIS. So this is gonna be a basic intro to just give you the proper words to communicate and uh, look up your questions online, I guess. So uh, GIS, Nowadays, pretty much everyone has had some sort of interaction with GIS in their lives. It can be inside your phone. If you pull up Google Maps to go somewhere, this is GIS. Inside your car, if you uh, use your car's GPS to get anywhere, it's GIS. Uh, even the buses now, the buses talk to you to tell you where, what station you're at. Uh, even a train will do that as well. Um, and you can like real time track your, um, your move across the city. Um, and that's all GIS. So we're pretty used to consuming GIS. Um, but not a lot of people know what GIS actually is. So uh, it's GIS stands for Geographic Information Systems. So it's basically, it's based on the science of geogra geogra geography. And uh, it's basically what it does is allows you to collect and to handle the data, to analyze it and to be able to, to visualize it so that you can, or that people can have a better understanding of things that are in 3D and sometimes at a very massive scale, um, and it gives them tools to properly extract information from that and to communicate that, that information with other people. So if we go back in time, GIS wasn't the GIS that we know today. It started with basic maps, uh, maps of the sky, maps of the stars. Uh, people wanted started to want to explore the world and find the fastest way to go somewhere. So if you wanted to get spices and it would take someone three months to get to the spices and someone else one month to get to the spices, uh, that was a vastly superior choice. And then it implied that you would know exactly how to map out your route and that you wouldn't know to go and optimize uh, your, your trip to wherever you needed to go. So even back then, they had some of the same issues that we have today. So the first world map is way, way before modern times. And if we go forward in time to what is closer to what we know today, so modern technology, uh, we're looking at the mid 60s when the first like GIS systems are created and uh, it went super fast from there. Um, it, it started because technology wasn't what it is today. So it was very minimal, but uh, when ESRI start, created, I think it was 1973, Esri is the big, big company that is behind, behind a lot of the GIS that we know today. So in the 70s, they started and then they expanded very rapidly. If some people, I, I worked in the past with MapInfo, which 
I I don't know if there are that many users anymore, but if you it's a thing still in geography. Uh some people still use map info. I've used that, I think some years ago uh for one class. Uh but then in a lot of uh academic institutions, what we have is ASRI. So ArcGIS, this is a lot of uh the um deals that they have with universities uh they are they make it cheap for universities to use it but then in uh the industry uh then they make them pay a lot but so um 2004 there's open street map so the open source started gaining speed in the early 2000s in response to the fact that Esri is so was so big and it was basically hoarding all of the money. And there was a need to also have this equivalent that would make uh geospatial data free to use to people, whereas Esri was basically keeping that under wraps and uh having a hold over the not necessarily the data, but the way to use it in the tools. So nowadays, um, the big, big players, I would say, is ArcGIS and QGIS. And the people that use GIS is, um, well, what we have in mind is usually like natural resources. So forestry uh, in my project, which is uh, Forêt Climat. So it's a forest and climate uh, portal that where we uh, share data. Uh, and we allow uh, groups to bring in their data and share them, and then we can diffuse them publicly as well. And then we use the data to um, come up with a uh, scientific project. So uh, that's based at Laval, but this is very forestry, biology focused. Uh, but uh, transportation is also a big uh, player like we can tell uh, with GPSs in every car, but also electric cars, autonomous cars, um, that's, they're big users of GIS. I think I last gave that talk in 2022. So that was this big thing and I kept it because I thought it was very funny, but uh, real estate are big users of GIS. And there was one thing, uh, it was like a TikTok thing. Someone on TikTok went and kind of figured out that Zillow was gouging the prices of homes. So they had like this whole division that would buy, purchase homes and bring up the neighborhood. Like they would drive up the prices of the house in one neighborhood and, um, and then maximize their profit. And it got so big and it got, uh, scrutinized so much that it kind of shut down that division. It didn't last very long, but I thought it was hilarious to be like, oh, if you know a little bit of GIS and you can figure out what other people do, you can just bring down a whole division at Zillow. So real estate, very big. Obviously, you want to know uh, how expensive the houses are in the neighborhood. So there are algorithms to figure out how to price a home. Um, and that's what they do. Also, um, insurance, insurance, super big on GIS. Um, I, I live in a neighborhood that is uh, very old. It's a very, very old neighborhood. And the insurance companies have decided that it doesn't matter what your house looks like, you do not get insured anymore. Actually, it's condos. They don't want to insure condos anymore. But in the neighborhood, they started refusing outright to just insure anyone because it's too risky because the buildings are too old. And they stopped insuring. So they just rely on maps and GIS and they can also track down. In some cases they get it wrong uh, and they just don't do, do it right if they don't have the weather, but they'll use GIS to make sure that, uh, for example, one side of the city had hail, the other side didn't. And if you were standing right on the edge, you can tell pretty accurately whether it's real hail damage or whether you went out with a hammer and decided to just go to town on your, your roof to get insurance money. And this is a story that I know from an insurance company that actually had to map out precisely where the hail stopped so that you could tell that um, the hammer job was not hail. So insurance, big, big users. And this is a election year. Uh, 
coming up in the in the US. And one thing that I find always so amazing is gerrymandering. If you ever want to go down a rabbit hole and see how fancy gerrymandering is getting, this is GIS perfectly executed. Uh, how to influence election results based on previous data, based on predictive data and based on geography, it's amazing. So gerrymandering is basically the art of, or the science of making sure that you cut out specifically specific areas that are going to vote for you in order to win elections. And that is something that is done in the US, um, but even, even in Canada, uh, they use GIS to make sure that they spend as much time as possible in areas that are less likely to vote for them. Um, so that's still, you know, pretty based in GIS. Um, so I'm sure that I I linked a, an article that I thought was pretty pretty good and easy to understand. It was from the last election, so 2021. Um, but I'm sure the Guardian is going to come up with something similar. But uh, that's a good read. Um, that I highly recommend if they still exist. I didn't check actually that it was still online, but uh, I thought it was pretty good. And yeah, unfor oh, unfortunately, uh, two years ago, I linked Ukraine, but I added Gaza now um, because unfortunately, um, some of the good maps that were created in the recent years were exploring the situation in Ukraine because because of all the attacks coming from everywhere, it was super hard to picture everything that was going on at the same time. And you needed a good visual representation with maps. And um, when it was going on like pretty, pretty quickly, like news changed by the day, um, maps were super useful. And Reddit is really good uh, for uh, to, to be a source for, uh, maps and inspirations, and also good um, source of uh, interesting maps. So it's Mapborn. So if you go on Reddit and you look up Mapborn, a lot of information. Now, now it's not as intense. Uh, it's not as Ukraine intense. It's more Israel Gaza in, intense, but um, still good, very informative maps that uh, definitely rec recommend if you need inspiration or if you need to have a good understanding of what's going on in the world, map porn is a good source of uh, those examples of maps that tell whole stories. So to create those maps, uh, there are multiple types. I, I touched a little bit on that. Um, so you have the big paid software that is ArcGIS. It's made by Esri. So Esri is the big company and they have Per countries, they have uh, Esri Canada, they have Esri US, they have Esri everywhere. And their software that they uh, sell is ArcGIS. And this is expensive. It can be very expensive, but it's everywhere. It's almost in all of the universities. A lot of governments still run on ArcGIS, even though it's, it costs a lot of money. Um, and the way they work is that they start in with the undergraduates, they make it really cheap so that we get taught in school to use ArcGIS. And then when people move out of the academic system and to work, they need ArcGIS. So they ask their boss to buy ArcGIS. So that's a little bit of our business, business model to get you hooked on ArcGIS and then you bring it with you to work. But there's also uh, software that is free to use. So I mentioned uh, QGIS, which to me is the most user-friendly, the closest to ArcGIS, um, and the best, I would say. Uh, GDAL is not user-friendly, but it's it runs behind a lot of the software, the visual software. So like QGIS will make use of GDAL, but also if you do Python, if you do R, they'll also make use of the libraries in GDAL. So there are a lot of open source, but I would say QGIS right now to me is the best. And there's also software that is free to use. And I've seen projects like 
university projects, graduate projects running on Google Maps. But the issue with Google Maps is that it's free to use because you are the product. So with data safety, it's not, you can't always tell it, where your data is going and what the your deal with Google is. So depending on the nature of your data, I wouldn't go first with a Google-based project. Like if you have mental disability data sets and you just release it and then in six months Google says well you didn't pay so now this data set is public and doesn't matter if you want it or not then you're a little bit screwed so Google Maps very good and funny on your phone if you need to find the closest restaurant for scientific projects I would not recommend it and okay so we talked about the software but when we're in a software, regardless of the one we choose, there are always some, the same data types that come back. So you're typically going to work with either a raster data set or a shapefile or a vector. Actually, I wrote shapefile, but it would be more of a vector data set. So if it's a raster, you think of uh, images, uh, sometimes LiDAR products. So the LiDAR is just data points in 3D but then you can extract some more data sets out of those to simplify them and um, make the files not as huge. So those products usually are 2D and they're rasters. So they're just pixels. So uh, satellite Im imageries, and sometimes you go from a uh, vector, so streets, points, data points, and then you create heat maps and those heat maps are rasters. So, Rasters don't have to be a square, it can be any shape, but what is always true is that it's rows and columns made of pixels. So every pixel has a value or multiple values, and uh, they're arranged in rows and columns. Whereas vectors such as shape files, they're more for rows, uh, for points. Um, think of uh, the border, the border of a country like an outline of a country or city limits, anything that is just lines or shape, these are vectors and they're, uh, they cannot be treated the same as rasters uh, on a GIS software. Sometimes they can do pretty much the same, but sometimes they don't use the same algorithm. So you have to make sure that you know which type of file you're using. In Another thing that you might stumble upon is either a geodatabase or a geopackage. A geodatabase is ArcGIS based. So if you have a file, you receive a file that it, the extension is .gdb, that's probably going to be easier for you to read it in ArcGIS Pro or in the old version of ArcMap. Um, but if you can, and if actually if you don't have ArcGIS, you can ask the person who's sending you the, the files to send you a geo package instead. So that can be open with RGIS and also most of the GIS softwares out there. So it's a database, just like any other relational database, uh, but you can have uh, some tables, you can have uh, the rasters and uh, those vectors, polygon line points, uh, like a shape file. So you could have a collection of shape files. You can have a collection of uh, rasters. You can have topology. So you could have definition of height inside of that uh, database and also just loose tables. Could be um, CSVs, it could be text files. These could all fit inside a, a geo database that can be open with ArcGIS. And the same can be said with a geo package. Same thing, but unbranded. So when I said that there is uh, information related to either a raster pixel or uh, an um, element inside of a vector, uh, we mean two things. One thing is the location. So uh, X, Y coordinates or a specific code related to an area. The attribute is the quality of your point, your line. So is it, um, does it have a name? Does it have a color? Does it have a length? Does it have anything related to 
anything else but location is called an attribute. So you can see, for for example, uh, you have names of people. Then in this case, you have street names, uh, but it could be uh, latitude, longitude, if it's just a random point anywhere. And then you could have more attribute information, for example, um, the color of the house or the number of stories inside a house, for example. So two things, and sometimes one or the other is going to be missing. So you're going to receive a shape file, for example, with just locations and points, uh, but nothing associated with it. So you maybe you, that's the kind of file you need, maybe not. Uh, but that's um, that means you just basically have an empty data set with just locations. Uh, but what's trickier is when you don't have the location. So sometimes you have a uh, CSV file and it's not related to anything to the GIS software. So you have to manually select which column is what. So which column is the latitude and longitude. So in that case, uh, that's slightly harder for you because you're going to have more steps to do in order to properly read your data set in QGIS or IGIS. But um, so that's the trickier one, I, I would say. But 99.9% .9 of the time, what you need is location and attribute. And one thing that trips people up so often is projections. That I cannot explain to you in a whole hour and a half. Impossible. You would you will need several weeks or months to if you want to properly understand projections, you'll have to spend a lot of time doing some uh, researching and mental practicing of 3D things put into 2D, 2D results. It's um, it's quite complicated for a lot of people, but you can either go with, I'll, I'll memorize my projection, or um, I'll spend a lot of time and uh, I'll figure everything out and I'll be a pro. But you can go without understanding anything if you just memorize what projection you need to use and just reuse that one every single time. But what a projection is, is the issue that we have with the planet being round-ish and our need to see things in 2D. So the planet is not a perfect sphere. It's kind of wonky and maybe a little bit warped. And if you want to put it into a 2D map, uh, you're going to have issues with the middle part being a little, a lot wider than the top parts in your image. And also, because the planet is not a perfect sphere uh, and you want to present straight lines, then you, you need to calculate a warping value to get straight lines out of something that it wouldn't be straight if you had it like in your hands. So throughout time, uh, they, the, every projection, like every year, decade, the projections refined and were more precise, but um, it means that you can have data from 20, 30, 40 years ago that are going to be in projections that are deprecated. And now you need to kind of approximate the connection or the co co correlation between the previous projection and your current projection. So that can be very tricky, spe specifically if you work with historical data that are from, you know, 80 years ago or maybe maybe less, maybe even 30 years ago can be a nightmare. But also, because the way you, we we cut out little slices of the planet to spread it out into a 2D image, um, depending on where you are, it does it might mean that a certain projection may not fit well for your location, your country, or you know, just the place you are on the on in the world. So depending on where you are on the planet, you might need to use a different projection. And also it's very political. So some country might want to use their projection and another country will use another projection. And if you want to use the whole world, then it's like there's more of a generic projection that fits pretty much everyone. But then you might receive data from one country and data from another one. And then you want to put them together and they're not the same projection. So if you put them 
side by side. One's going to be super big. The other one's going to be super shrinked and it's not going to work. And you don't know why. Well, the answer is different projections. And also projections, I said they're pretty political, but also they're rooted in, of course, racism. So if you see a map, I don't know if my next slide is, yeah. If you can, you don't have to uh, do it, but if you want, you can Google the true size of, so it's the true size of Duckham. Uh, if you want to, if someone wants to share it or not, if you Google the true size of uh, the first hit is the, is the right website. But this website gives you an idea of how, how worked some countries are according to this generic, uh, let's say, European-centric map or projection. So because the Norton part was a lot of Europeans and North Americans, they established that, uh, one, they would be on top because there's no reason why Australia shouldn't be where Canada is right now. So it was established that the United States, Canada would be on one side, then um, uh, then Europe would be in the middle, and then Russia would kind of be split into two edges because it doesn't matter. But also they are kind of expanded relative to the center, so the equator, and also the South. Um, poor countries, colonized countries are there. They're not as important relative to European countries. Um, so there are over the years, uh, some different projections and some different maps that were uh, created, shifting everything and making some other countries uh, appear bigger. But if you want an idea, um, so this is also, this is China. And if you want to put China over China, uh, you see that it doesn't work. And that's because uh, they start you with three countries and they have different projections. So if you just, you can uh, right click on the country and just search it again, and it's going to give you the current projection, but also it gives you an idea of how, if you use a different projection, it changes the size, but also the angle. Um, so there's, you can, it can go wrong. Things can go very wrong if you get the wrong projection, but let's take China and see what it would look like compared to Russia. So if you move it up, it gets bigger. And if you move it down to the equator, it looks slightly smaller, but India is a little bit the same. Like if we want to compare, it looks pretty small around here. But if we put it over, over Canada and the US, it's pretty big. So it's part of also how we see the world. Um, so it's very political. And um, if you work in these kinds of issues, you might want to pick a projection that clearly vehicles the kind of message you want to you wanna choose or you want to spread. So that's one thing that is pretty cool. And I think that this website is a lot of fun. I like to play around with it before every time I teach this. Um, I like to play around with it because it reminds me of how weird it is that we just decided that Colombia doesn't matter, uh, but Canada does. Or I guess France and Germany. I don't know. But it's, um, yeah, that's the projections for you. So back to the slides. So we have we have the uh, GIS, we have the data, um, the way to represent the data. But if you want the data, um, there are plenty of new ways now to get. Oh, I'm get I'm seeing the chat here. Oh, uh, raster is faster, but vector is corrector. Um, depends. Depends on what you want to do. Oh, love map info. Okay, yeah. So I was missing your your chat. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, no map info. It is. It was from back then. Um, raster is faster, but vector is corrector. I would say that raster nowadays they're pretty big. They're huge, so they can go fast. Uh, but sometimes you're you're run out of memory because it's they're so big. So I wouldn't say I wouldn't say that nowadays it's absolutely true. 
uh, because sizes aren't the same anymore. And, and um, Pore ouvert, yes, Pore ouvert. So this is, uh, so there are a lot of initiatives in uh, Quebec, in Canada, in the world to open data and to make data accessible to so many people as long as they can use it. And sometimes you have GIS data in those uh, portals. And if you don't know how to use it, it kind of defeats the point. And they don't have, like Forêt Ouverte is kind of, is fine because you can visualize it in a kind of Google mappy way. But if you want to do anything with it later, um, you're kind of stuck with whatever they, they show you. So it's still, still a pretty good idea to have a way to analyze and work with the data once you've seen it. Uh, there's a lot of uh, links. It's a lot of uh, GIS sources that are free. And I've added this one, Geospatial Historian and Programming Historian. Those are tutorials. And some are, are a bit outdated, um, but they're still very good. And we're going to do a small tutorial from Geospatial Historian that I liked last uh, two years ago, and I still like, so I think it's pretty cool. Uh, so I'll, I'll paste that in the chat. So we're going to have a look at QGIS and also a look at ArcGIS. A uh, very short overview of ArcGIS. And we'll look at QGIS because that's the open source thing that I want you to uh, remember. And because that's the ones that are going to be free and you can use it everywhere on every machine. ArcGIS is very fun, very complete. And I use it for work um, because I could not get and most of the things done that I want to do. Uh, but I'm using it as a service a lot more complex what I do. But I would say that for 93% of uses, QGIS will be a very, very good option for anyone. And you don't have to ask for money to get that. So definitely recommended. The only cases I would say is probably hydrology. Like if people work with water, I would not recommend QGIS with ArcGIS. Uh, instead of ArcGIS, I would recommend to go with ArcGIS. But most of everything else, you'll be plenty fine with QGIS. So QGIS used to be called quantum GIS. Now we they go by QGIS. So saying quantum GIS is kind of a no-no now for reasons. Um, but you might, if you, if you don't succeed at finding your answer with QGIS, you might want to try Googling quantum GIS instead. But I would say that in 2024, the majority of the questions have been answered under QGIS. So it's free. It's open source. You can run Python and R scripts, which is also the case in ArcGIS, by the way. You can also run scripts in Python. The difference is that you can run vanilla Python scripts in our QGIS, but ArcGIS has a version that's called ArcPython, and you can only run those codes, uh, those ArcPython scripts within ArcGIS. So if your code, if you get a code from someone and it doesn't work in QGIS, uh, make sure that it's not an ArcPython code uh, because then you're going to be screwed. You need to work with ArcGIS instead of QGIS. A lot of formats, uh, S3 formats are proprietary and they can't, they don't really work with QGIS, but over the years, QGIS has figured out ways to read a lot of, and if not most of the S3 formats. So right now I would say in almost any case, except for geodatabases, you're fine with QGIS. So in the meantime, if you want to download QGIS, you can take 10 minutes. It's not super heavy. Uh, it usually doesn't take that much time to download uh, and install, but you don't have to. So for the, se the second half, you can just follow with the screen. I'll show you some things and you don't have to like use QGIS to follow. Uh, what I'm going to say is that when you download QGIS, 
you have an option to download one number or another number that is called LTR. So the LTR number is the version that is gonna be long-term. So they're gonna support it for a longer time than the current version. And I would say for most users, the LTR version is fine because you can use it for a, a long time. But sometimes there might be an issue or a feature that you need and you don't have. Um, and you look up online and they say, oh, that's gonna be fixed or that's gonna be implemented in the next version. So in those cases, I would recommend that you switch to a newer version. But if you're fine with an Altier version, just stick with it. You're, you're gonna be fine until another major uh, release happens and then you can switch. And it's usually, I would say, pretty stable. QGIS hasn't moved all that much in the last couple, well, last decade. Um, so you can do most of the things uh, you used to be able to do in maybe slightly different ways in the new version. So I would say that uh, QGIS versions, as opposed to RGIS versions, they can last a long time. RGIS, you might be very screwed if you're not using the latest version and you try to do something, might break everything. It's it's more of a nightmare, but that's how they get you paying. We have on one side, so this side is ArcGIS. The other side is QGIS. As you can see, they're pretty similar. QGIS is more based on older versions of ArcGIS, which used to be called ArcMap. So there was a tool, or multiple tools, and one tool was called ArcMap. And it looked a little bit more like that, and it uh, kept looking like that until a few versions of ArcGIS. But now we're at ArcGIS Pro, which is the amazing new ArcGIS, which you pay a lot more money for, and you have a subscription that you need to pay for. So, um, the ArcGIS Pro is, if you're used to ArcMap and the old ArcGIS, it's kind of a steep uh, hill to climb when learning the new. I know that a lot of people who are veterans, like ArcGIS veterans, and they still refuse to move to ArcGIS Pro. So if you've never used ArcGIS in your life and you started with ArcGIS Pro, it's a good time to start learning because um, if you have a history and you want to get back into it, and you're like, oh no, what is this? Uh, it's the new RGIS Pro and everybody hates it. Um, unfortunately, I picked RGIS Pro for the portal. And actually I, I picked RGS Enterprise. So I need to interact with it with RGIS Pro. So I had to learn it and now I kind of like it. So I kind of like it a lot. So if you have the money, and uh, you can, or you have a deal with your university, RGIS Pro is not a bad option. The only thing that I don't like about them is how pricey they are for things that have existed for so many years. And also they can be a little messy in their versions. Like they, had some, they can be very buggy, but it's so pretty good. So if you see here, I am connected to a remote a remote server. And that's one thing that is done pretty seamlessly in ArcGIS Pro is that you can connect to a server and access all the data from that server pretty easily. So I use my uh, university credentials and I access my server and it's seamless and I reopen Ar ArcGIS and it reconnects automatically. With QGIS, you can connect to servers. It's slightly more complicated and we're not gonna get into it, but just know that that's one of the, I would say biggest differences is that uh, Q RGIS is very seamless when it it's um, when you're talking about uh, servers and doing things online and sharing things online. That's, I guess that's where the future is and they have a lot of people working on it. So they get like the Amazon, the AWS accounts, the Google Cloud accounts. So you can get an instance, a RGS instance on AWS like this so easily. You can start running jobs on AWS if you pay for it. QGIS, it's going to be more of a DIY thing and you're going to spend perhaps a lot of less money, but more time on it. So 
it's always a uh, compromise. So just just to have a quick look, I think I have those, a couple of things that I wanted to do and show you with ArcGIS. Okay, so in ArcGIS, if you want to analyze data, uh, you're going to, here, you can click on tools or geoprocessing here. And if you look, for example, raster, then it gives you a number of things you can do with raster. But there's so many things that you can do. It's forever. It goes on and on and on that you can easily get confused and get lost in the amount of things that you can do with ArcGIS. Um, on the flip side, you have a lot of support, online support, documentation. Sometimes not great, sometimes pretty great, but it's all supported by S3. So you know that there's going to be one web page for the tool you need. And um, yeah, so if if you need help with something, Esri will be able to give you help and they have a support email address that you can email them to and then you can you know, get support. With QGIS, you have this. So you have some tools, uh, which are the same as this. Like a lot of them are the same as this. Uh, sometimes slightly different. Sometimes the algorithm is slightly different. So you might not get the same results in RGIS and QGIS. Um, and that you have to figure out which one you are going to pick uh, because both are vetted, but not both are the same. But if you want to increase your power with QGIS, you can install plugins and you have a ton of options here that you can also, a bit similar to that, you can get lost in the options, but what, I think is a downside with uh, ArcGIS, uh, QGIS, is that sometimes they're not well maintained. So last update was in 2023, so that's not bad, uh, 2021. So sometimes you want something and then it's this guy who probably worked on that plugin in 2021 for a master's thesis and they're done now and they left and they're not maintaining it, maintaining it anymore. And you're like, oh, this is exactly what I want to do. And you download it and you install it and it does not work. And then you're stuck because you have to be a developer at this point because you need to fix it because it doesn't work, but it does exactly what you want, but it's not maintained. So Yes, it's free. Yes, it's open source. Yes, you can even contribute it if you have the skills. You can write your own uh, plugin and then make it available to everyone. But there's no guarantee that you're going to get support. Usually, the plugins that get very, very, very popular, like the one that in, is going to be in the tutorial in the next few minutes, they're going to be made avail available within the interface. So they're going to be packaged with QGIS. So if it's something that's very popular, then you can expect it to become part of the regular versions of uh, QGIS and not be supported by uh, <laughs> GrassGIS, yes. But uh, yeah, so if you uh, love something and you use it, uh, the best way to keep it is to be vocal about it and say that you love it so that they include it to QGIS. With the catalog in RGS, we didn't show anything here, uh, but if I go to portal here, I, with RGS, I'm connected to the portal that I have at the university that people are working on and we have uh, 60 years of data. So if I want to ha um, have access to the data that is publicly available, I just have to click in the catalog I go to my uh, organization and then I see all of the data that we have. And the one that I want, for example, is this one. And I can right click on it, add to new, add to new map and bam, it's creating me a, a map automatically. It's gonna add the data. I don't have anything to do. It's gonna pop, it's gonna take a few seconds because we're running Zoom at the same time and this is a laptop and then bam. This is what we have. Um, yeah, so it's not displayed here. I'm going to make it appear. And then I've got all the colors, all the shapes, everything. Everything has been designed 
by uh oh there is some missing oh here uh it's all been designed by the data steward who created a certain um combination of colors and and uh, weight to the lines and all of that comes straight from the the server to my computer i don't have to edit it it's edited as intended and it's going to bring up some background layers that I can use. I can change them if I don't like these. I can go to what is called a base map. So it's a background map. And I can change that to, let's see that. Modify it. And then bam, this looks black and white. And that black and white is great for printing for publications. And that's pretty easy. But we can do pretty much the same thing and end up with the same results with our GIS, uh, QGIS. Um, so what I did previously, because of these data, they're on the server. So I just saved uh, this one. So the rows and the streets. I right clicked and I exported the data, export features. And I just uh, decided uh, on the location here. We're not going to do it, but it's just going to bring up a menu. So if you're connected to a server and you want to extract some data, you can do it manually. If, say, you're working with someone who doesn't have access to that server, you can always extract the data if you're authorized to do it. Uh, and then you save it. And as you can see here, that was a uh, line. So we're talking about the shape file. So I would have to select um, the feature to uh, save to. And I already did that. So we're just going to move to QGIS, and we're going to open the shape file that it created. So, um, so if I'm in uh, QGIS, the quick way to do it is here, open data source management, and then you have all of your options. So I want a vector, and I already saved it here, here, and when you have a data set, like when you have a shape file, you have one file. And I, at the very beginning, some years ago, I used to share the shape file, just the shape file file, the .shp file, but it comes with a number of other files. So if you don't share all of the files that you come up with, you, you, you're not gonna get anything. They're not gonna be able to open it because it's gonna miss, uh, this file and the other. So shapefile is not just one file. It's a file that communicates with other files that gives you an idea of what your visual should look like and where it's located and uh, the projections and everything. It's not just a shapefile, it's everything else. So always remember that if you share a shapefile, share all of those other files, the DBF, SBN, uh, all of these, they need to be shared with it. Even if they don't look like they are doing anything, they are. So I'm adding this, and it looks like nothing here, uh, mainly because um, uh, mainly because it uh, this was set by RGS on RGS. Here we only have the raw data, but if I wanted to modify that, I could go into uh, this. Uh, the the name so see it's pretty much the same thing so main map uh, all of your the list of your different layers on the side and if I double click on it then I can go to the symbology so I can give it a color a shape um, and based on attributes so the symbology here I can go to say categorize I know what category they're using so I can go quickly in there. And I can say, okay, so I want it to classify on the type of uh, row that is, so it's all in French, and I can classify it, and then I can manually see, you can see class one, two, three, four, see all of those were bundled with the other classes, I guess, and I could start manually changing all of them. So it's a little bit more tedious, and you can do it manually. Um, okay. Uh, it doesn't look the same because I didn't edit it. Um, but again, it's you do it once and then you save your project and it's saved 
uh, in the way you want. So it's not, I mean, it's it's a little bit tedious, but once you're done, you don't have to do it a million times. Um, and let's say that I want some base maps like this ones or the other ones, we have OpenStreetMap that we can add. So we could double click on OpenStreetMap here. And that's gonna give you a, a, a base map that is, from OpenStreetMap. So OpenStreetMap is a little, I described it a little bit earlier, but it's it's like Google Maps, but it's open source. You can contribute to it. If you know that your neighborhood doesn't, uh, is not represented well in Google Maps because it's changed re recently, well, you can go to OpenStreetMap and edit it manually, submit it a little bit like uh, uh, Wikipedia. Like you can submit it, it's going to be reviewed, and then it's going to be added to the database. And then you can use it for yourself on your maps or wherever you want. If you are not satisfied with this one that I think is not that great, uh, especially with the ugly colors that I chose for my roads, you can download. Again, I um, added a plugin. So I search for a plugin that is called Quick Map Services. And I installed it. And then you get quick quick map services and you can search and you can get a ton of uh of maps. And fun fact, if you're using satellite imagery for free, Bing satellite imagery is way better than uh Google Maps. So if you want here, we can have a look at this. Oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that. So Bing, pretty good. If we add Google Satellite. Uh, so it's different uh, times, but um, usually forestry for um, satellite images, Bing is very used because it's high quality in many places and very recent. So. Weirdly enough, I recommend Bing Maps satellite imagery for for uh, um, base maps. All right, so I think that's pretty much all that I wanted to say for just the basics of Google. Like you can navigate; it's pretty much like in every other software nowadays. If you want, if you want to zoom in, zoom out, you use the you can scroll with your mouse. Um, or you could use um, the um, magnifier and select a map to zoom into, or you can use your, uh, you can scroll to zoom out. So that's, at this point, I guess, pretty intuitive. Uh, the only thing that is more tricky about QGIS is the use of plugins. So you need to be aware from the get-go that, you want to uh, manage plugins carefully and not start using an outdated plugin that's going to be deprecated in the next version. Um, I would say if you've never created a map for publications uh, ever, I would say get your, like, think of spending maybe three days on a map if you already know what you're doing. So if you wanna publish a map that is gonna be good for a journal, you wanna spend a, about three days. So you wanna get the good base map, the one that is in black and white with the right names at the right place, places. Um, and then you're gonna to wanna to edit it in certain ways. And that's not quick. Even for someone who's experienced, it can take a while. So if you have a pretty complex map, give yourself, three days to get the map to a point where you're confident that it's going to be good for publications. So sometimes people overlook the difficulty of creating good maps, but if you need help, you call the local forestry or uh, geography department. They have experts that can uh, happily do it for you for a fee. Um, but um, yeah, so making a good map for publication takes a while. Um, one thing that I guess you might have noticed is that uh, this um, space, this layer, uh, layers uh, box um, contains all the layers of your map. And these are like paint layers. So you overlap them 
Sometimes you can play with um, the opacity of one layer compared to the other, but the difference is that the layers can talk to each other because of the uh, geographical reference that you have. So sometimes when you do an analysis, you can use one layer and calculate uh, something on that layer using another one. Or sometimes you can um, uh, extract what is what they have in common, uh, what is specifically what overlaps over those two, uh, two layers. So think of it as paint that can talk to each other. And then you can turn on or off uh, depending on what you need. So, because for example, if I turn on the Bing map and it's a full 100%, a 0% opacity, no, 100% opacity, then it doesn't matter if I turn on the OpenStreetMap or Google Satellite, uh, they're not going to show. So I have to turn it off and then I get OpenStreetMap. So, yeah. So when you create maps, you want to make sure that uh, you know which layer goes on top of which other. And you can also make groups. So let's say I want a group for my base maps. So here, uh, it doesn't show, but this one is uh, groups. And you could, for example, bundle all the base maps together and turn that group on or off if needed. So sometimes if you have big projects or projects in separate locations, uh, you could turn on or off a whole uh, a whole chunk of your experiment that is not located at the same place as the other. And sometimes for rendering, it helps. Uh, if you're rendering something very, very um, huge, like a huge map, uh, you might want to turn it off so that it doesn't have to render every single time and just crash your computer. All right. So for the last few minutes, I'll show you a tutorial that I have here from, oh, maybe that's the one. Oh, maybe it was Programming Historian. Oh, there you go. That's the one. Sorry. That's the one. Uh, so this is the one, uh, slightly a little bit outdated, uh, with just a few details. Uh, this georeferencer tool that you don't need. Actually, maybe they changed it. You don't need to uh, install it from the plugins. It's already pre-installed, so you should be good. Um, but we'll go through it pretty quickly. And if you liked it, I highly recommend that you go check out the other things uh, that they have to offer. Um, so QGIS. So we're going to start with a blank sl slate. And so what we're going to show is how to map out an old map from to a new GIS um, setup. So sometimes you have old maps. And so in forestry, we usually work with newish maps or photos that you have to georeference. So if you uh, have a photo, a satellite photo of a road, and then you need to make sure that you have the exact points that follow along, along the road, you need to have that image, that photo, and you need to glue it specifically to the data points you have. That's very easy when you want to do it with modern images. But I learned two years ago that people in history, uh, the historians, they love to do it with old maps. And I thought that's crazy. But then I realized that it's actually a thing that people do. And that's very difficult, but there is a way to do it kind of easily. Uh, then all the skills you need is patience and precision. But I'll show you how to do it. And I thought it was pretty cool. And I have never had to do it ever again because I don't work with old data. But I thought it was uh, very interesting for a lot of people. So uh, I'll open. And you see it's a very few steps. Uh, but what you need to keep in mind is always uh, projections, 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 projections. So right now, I have here, if you look at my projections for the project, it's in WGS84, I believe. Is that the one? That's not the one. It's in, I don't know, 
Oh yeah, that, that's the one. Okay, that's the one. Um, that is a very generic, it's, uh, it's the current, it's the, the typical map that you see everywhere. But like I said, if you are working in a specific area, you're gonna have to set a new projection. And in this case, we're gonna work with an old map of Prince Edward Island. That is from the tutorial. And as you can see, it's very limited and it's not the typical way you see Prince Edward Island if you look into it. Uh, that it also is a projection that is deprecated. Uh, that might cause a little bit of some issues, but uh, for um, the needs of the this presentation, it doesn't really matter. But when you select your projections, you need to make sure that it's a current one or that you have a good reasons to use a deprecated one. In this case, my, my reason to use a deprecated one is it's from the tutorial and I will follow it. So I set the uh, reference system to that one. So I, I could have searched 2291 and it would have bring up this one. And I said, okay. And then it's giving me a warning. And that's why also why I want to keep it. If you ever see that warning in QGIS, the ballpark transform, have a look at the projection you're using and have a look at whether it's deprecated and maybe it's it's been replaced um, with a new one. And the new one is 4326, I believe. And what it's telling you is like, I'm gonna do it, but it's not gonna be perfect. So you should pick the other one, but I still know how to do it. And that's gonna be an approximation of what you want. So we're okay with this, this is fine. Uh, but one thing you need to know is that QGIS will do on the flight reprojections. So that means that if your project is not in the same projection as your files, QGIS is most likely not even gonna tell you. Or it's, it's going to tell you, well, I know it's not the same projection, but all projected however you like. And it's gonna reproject everything. So it's gonna appear fine. You will see everything displayed perfectly. But once you want to analyze the data, projections, sometimes they don't have the same units. So you could have a uh, units in uh, projection in inches and the other one in millimeters. What happens when you try to calculate a distance or a surface using one that is not in the same unit as the other one? Well, you know, you crash your spaceship because you got it into inches. So you'll want to get everything with the right projection and always keep in mind that maybe QGIS is tricking you. Maybe it's lying to you and it's telling you that the projection is right when it's not at all. So in this case, we started the project with the projection that I wanted. And then we'll add just for show a vector that is uh, this one. And we select this shape file and then we add it and it's also pretty grumpy because it doesn't have the same uh hold on i'm gonna close that because it doesn't have the same uh projection and then to change the projection to, uh, for this one that is projecting i think in the modern projection you can go to prop uh layer CRS, so the projection, and you can set it to 2291, which really isn't. And in this case, I don't know why makes uh, makes QGIS complain and reset the overall projection. So you have to do it again. Didn't do that for me yesterday, but it's doing it today. But then, so we need to have this with a map. And if we try it, so we can open um a raster and we try to open up the map here so it's an old map from 1863 and we add it and we see that we can't see it anywhere and at least for this one it says hey uh you have not projected your your map i don't know and we're like okay of course because it's a scan of an old map it does it's not projected so you could click on this and set a, a reference system, the same one. But if you look at it, if you zoom to the layer, 
it's not even at the same place as the other one. And the reason is that it doesn't know where to place it. It has no, it knows what projection you want to use, but it doesn't know where on the in the world this image is supposed to be. So you need to tell your computer and QGIS where that this is Prince Edward Island and it's located here with uh, above this um, uh, polygon file or the vector file. So the way to do it is that you go to layer and georeferencer. So it used to be a, a separate plugin. I didn't have to install it this, this time. So it's great. Love that for them. So georeferencer, you're going to have a new um a new window open and that's where the patient comes patients comes in you're going to have to open your infamous uh photo which is here and then you're going to have to say okay you are going to transform it to well, that's by default because i didn't close i didn't shut down my computer it would have forgotten but it already knows but technically you would have to tell it what projection you want and in this case i say oh save the points i'm gonna add a lot of points save them for me please and uh i want to load the project when it's done so i set up this and then i'm ready hopefully ready to go so I pick a point, a location, let's say this point here, and I zoom in because I want to be really precise. And then it says, okay, so what's the location of this point? And then I go to the map, I zoom into the layer, and I say, well, it's this point. Let's go. And there you go. And you say, okay, so it gives you one point. Then you ask, you go for another one. Let's go with this one up from the map, and then you zoom out, you zoom back in, and there you go. Map from Canva. Oh, sorry, I already did that. Oh, no. Yes, it's good. Okay. And then you have another one, and then you go again, and again, and again, and you, you add another one, and you go, oh, I forget. Did I put this here or there? And then you confuse, and then you regret everything you started doing. Okay, so I was pretty close, but this is gonna give you an indication of how much of a distance there is between your point and the point on the map. So it started. It starts to tell you, okay, I'm gonna have to stretch it out or shrink it in, in this area. We don't have that many points, but I think you get the idea. So you go around as many points, you can get points in the middle, you can po get points everywhere. Sometimes if there's an area that's not as accurate, you wanna add more points. And when you, once you're done, you press play and it's gonna chill reference your layer. And it, it can take a while if you have many points, uh, should add it to the map. And then it's uh, also pretty grumpy, but uh, I find that the first option is okay. Usually you get the default with this and it's pretty good. And then you have a new map. So this one is modified. And if you go and you go, oh, yay, pretty good. And then if you switch that layer to be on top of it, you're like, oh, no, I'm not that good. Uh, so you could go back and georeference again and um, extract your points. Oh, see, I got it almost right here. That's pretty good. Uh, and the more you do it, the more accurate it becomes. And then you can save all your points and reuse them for another, if someone else wants to do the map again, or you want to uh, improve on it in the future, you could just save your points and reload them. But that's a very cool and neat feature that I think um, a lot of people in uh, social sciences and history and uh, humanities in general could make use of. And here, I'm just changing uh, the appearance of the of the shape file so that you can see um, better through uh, capacity zero. So you can see better through it. See, okay. So if we zoom in, we can see that here, they're not aligning perfectly. So I would go and maybe put a point here, a point here, and maybe at the end of those lines to so make sure that we have straight lines. Um, but then yeah, lots of fun, hours of fun. And you could end up with a very precise map uh, that you can locate 
in the world, in Canada. And even you could add OpenStreetMap, map behind it, it's still complaining about the transformation, but then you could add it here and see if a township, for example, changed a lot and you could map out houses. So yeah, so, um, so yeah, lots of possibilities with all maps and you don't have to just go manually and look it up. You can just align them and make them work for you. All right, so five minutes left. And uh, all I wanna say is something that I've added recently. All right, so it, when you start working with GIS and uh, data, uh, you, you might come across uh, information that you probably shouldn't share. I was using a data set with OpenRefine on bed bug, bed bug data, and it took me, uh, OpenRefine is another thing that I love. It cleans up data sets and uh, you go from a me messy data set to a clean data set and the clean data set was supposed to be an anonymized. And I quickly realized that it was not, it was not anonymized enough. So I, put points in Google Maps, and then I could cross-reference with bed bug complaints. And it became pretty obvious to me that I could target specifically which building. And it was buildings very frequently um, popular with immigrants. So I thought I can go from cleaning data sets to, oh, immigrants have bed bugs. And that didn't sit right with me. And that doesn't sit right with any, well, with a lot of people, even at the government now. So if we work with data, we're in this new era of pro data protection, and you might be tempted to start collecting data. And sometimes there's GIS data, because it's so, it's everywhere. So uh, GIS data is collected sometimes automatically, and you're stuck with it. But there are new laws. So this is a law 25 in Quebec. And if you do surveys and you start collecting data, you're responsible for them. So don't be, um, well, don't be fooled by the data and the access you have to them. Sometimes, even if it's just the IP address, you can track it down to basically a house. I don't know about Ontario, but if they don't have uh, the same legislation in Ontario, it's going to happen soon. Like it's going it, to, we're in this new world of legislation just because it's needed. So if you start playing with locations with people's houses and history related to um, neighborhoods, you have a responsibility that seemed trivial in the past, but now it's gonna be legal. It's like fees and fines and jail time uh, if you misuse data. So um, be careful with it and you know, it's uh, it's it's all fun and games until all of a sudden it's oh no I didn't know that I was collecting location data every minute for every people that was doing my survey, um so that's it that's my uh, word of warning uh, before uh you can have two minutes to ask questions I know it was pretty quick and you have a like an overview of everything but if you have questions more specific to what you want to do you can email me um because it's, it's a pretty complex thing, so it's not all solved in a day.